Well, good morning and welcome to the first market update of 2023. My name is Cole Pearson. We are so glad to have you with us. Uh, as we do, let me open us in a brief word of prayer and then we'll jump into our time together. Father God, thank you for uh, thank you for a new day. Thank you for this morning. Uh, that means that you've got uh, something planned for us. And Lord, as we talk today about uh, stewardship, I pray that you uh, allow us to uh, open our eyes and our hearts and our minds uh, to stewarding uh, all that you've given us, our time, our talent, as well as our treasure uh, for, for your kingdom uh, and for the good of those around us. Lord, I thank you for our speakers today. I pray that you be with them and help them to communicate clearly. I pray that you uh, bless our listeners and our audience and their families. Lord, we, we leave this up to you and we ask it in your son's name. Amen. Well, again, welcome to the One Ascent Market Update for Q1 2023. My name is Cole Pearson. I have the pleasure of serving as the president of Investment Solutions here at One Ascent. Uh, super excited to be joined today by Bob Dahl, the Chief Investment Officer at Crossmark Global Investments. Uh, Bob has even taken time from a, a family vacation to join us uh, this year. This is his, I think, fourth or fifth year consecutive of, of joining us on this call to share his 10 predictions. We're excited to have him with us. And then finally, we'll be joined by Nathan Willis, our very own Director of Portfolio Strategy at One Ascent, to talk about uh, what's happening at One Ascent, our outlook, and how we're serving uh, advisors and clients uh, through their portfolios. If you have questions throughout our time today, please submit those by email to info at oneascent.com. Uh, we'd love to get those answered uh, on the call if we can. If we can't, we'll follow up uh, shortly afterwards. This is a regular call. Uh, we do this every quarter on the third Tuesday of the quarter at 10 a.m. Central Time. So mark your calendars for our next call, which will be for Q2. April 18th. Well, as we jump into our time today, it, I would be remiss to not uh, start by kind of recapping 2022 with a quick snapshot of performance, uh, just taking a quick look at Q4 returns and how that finished the year. It was certainly a rough year for, for all markets. Um, here on the left, you can see a quick table with fourth quarter returns, the full year of 2022, and then also some broader context of the 10 year. Um, the S&P 500, which is one of the largest indexes and most known uh, for large cap companies in the United States, uh, did have a very strong fourth quarter, up 7.5%, which brought it uh, just under bear market territory for the year. So the S&P 500 was down 18% for the full year. Um, international stocks uh, outside the U.S. Uh, also had a strong quarter, a very strong quarter in the, in the fourth quarter, uh, bringing them to uh, a negative 13, negative 14% for the year. This is one of the first years uh, in the past decade or so that international stocks have actually outperformed uh, U.S. Uh, looking uh, broadly, uh, bonds as well uh, also gained ground in the fourth quarter, but in light of the full year, uh, down 13%. This was one of the worst uh, years for bond markets um, in the past really century. So just a, a quick snapshot of where markets were. Uh, equities down roughly 18% U.S., uh, down 14 or so internationally, down 13 in fixed income. When you look at the performance of our solutions, um, we run values-based uh, portfolios for uh, clients around the country. Here you can see just a snapshot of a few of those. We put them into risk-based allocations so that you can make sure that you're accomplishing your long-term financial ob objectives in line with the, the level of risk that you're, you're willing to take. So we have five uh, risk tolerances ranging from equity uh, down to preservation. And here you can see our actual returns through the, the balance of the year. So if I were to focus in on that middle column, uh, the one year column, you can see we underperformed our benchmarks by about a percentage to a percentage and a half uh, on average for the year 2022. Uh, we too had a strong fourth quarter, uh, but when you look at the longer term, the three year, uh, the five year since inception, we've been able to deliver strong performance against our benchmarks uh, in a values-based way. And so we're very thankful for that. We're very pleased with that. That is a, a credit and a testament to uh, the managers that we get to work with. And we'll get to hear from one of those, uh, from Bob Dahl here in just a moment. Um, but this is just a quick snapshot of performance. I would encourage you, if you're working with an advisor or using one of our solutions, that you speak with your advisor about your specific account. Uh, these are just a, a few uh, to share today. In light of performance, though, uh, one thing that is very important to us, it's central to all that we do at One Ascent, is values-based investing. And so as we do, I wanted to 
just uh, remind and share just a little bit and real quickly about how we do that before we get to our market update. So our approach to values-based investing uh, starts by assessing how a company interacts with every single person and every square inch. On the right-hand side here, you can see kind of the schematic or the framework by which we look at a company. We're looking at how a company interacts with people, but also how it interacts with places. Uh, the people that that business touches and the places that uh, it operates in and in uh, the, the, the local environment, the community that it serves, all those types of things. The way that we look at these companies, the way that we assess this impact is through what we call our three E's. We want to identify companies that we need to eliminate uh, for certain reasons. Uh, we certainly evaluate them to make sure they're great investments. But finally, we're looking to elevate companies that are making the world a better place. So to put another picture to that, to see that a little bit in action, eliminate uh, is, is where we seek to eliminate a company who is demonstrably and consistently harming their stakeholders, uh, those people in those places. That could be for reasons like uh, involvement in certain industries, involvement in things that uh, would be contradictory to, to our values, to the Lord's values, involvement in things like abortion or addictive products like gambling, pornography, uh, tobacco, uh, where there's been patterns of, of severe ethics controversies in the leadership of a company, those are all reasons that we might seek to eliminate a company from our universe. But on the flip side, we are in fact investing. We are looking to, to deploy capital into companies, into businesses uh, who are making the world a better place, um, where they're looking for the flourishing of these stakeholders, of these people in these places. That could look like um, affordable uh, housing, that could look like uh, fair wages, um, thriving uh, vocations. It could look like a number of things, a number of thematic things that we're trying to focus on as we seek to remove capital from companies that are causing harm and place that capital with companies who are bringing blessing. So that's what we do and how and how we do it and really our why at one ascent. Today's topic, though, the main topic is to talk about the markets and uh, what's going on as we start a new year. And so I am pleased to bring up Bob Dahl, uh, the Chief Investment Officer at Crossmark Global Investments. We've had the pleasure of working with Bob for uh, coming up on six years now uh, in a values-based, uh, values-aligned way. Bob has over 40 years of industry experience managing uh, billions of dollars in the large cap equity space, uh, in the long short space. He's a featured speaker, a regular contributor uh, all over uh, places like CNBC and Bloomberg TV, MoneyWise, Fox Business. Uh, so hopefully uh, his, he looks familiar. But Bob is here to share with us his 10 predictions for 2023. Bob? Thank you, Cole, and uh, for the kind words. And to everyone listening, a uh, happy new year. I, in the next few minutes, hope to translate our thoughts in the market via these 10 predictions um, as I spend time uh, as an investment strategist. But for the purposes, call my main pleasure is to manage the values-based one ascent large cap core growth and value portfolios. We'll touch on them with one slide at the very end. So we go to the next slide. Uh, you will see our view that the Fed is calling the shots. That's our theme for 2023. And the questions that come up are, will the Fed, the central bank of the United States insist on a 2% inflation rate? If they do, I think we're gonna have a recession. I don't see how we escape it. As you all know, inflation got out of hand in 2021, and while it started to come down, it's still at uns, uh, unacceptable levels. Or will the Fed say, you know, we've worked hard, maybe 3% is a good enough number, and, you know, if we get to 3.8 or something like that, they might say that's close enough to 3. If that's the language they adopt, which is not what they're saying currently, we could have a soft landing, and if they really try to uh, get it right in between the so-called soft landing or the shallow recession uh, could take place. And that is our main view. We think the Fed has done enough work already in raising rates at the second fastest pace in U.S. history that it's going to be hard for us to escape at least a shallow recession. The next slide indicates um, we think some of the key uh, questions for this year, and I'll try to touch on many of these. Have they tightened too much already? Will we have that recession? How far will earnings fall in this uncertain slowing environment? What in fact is the core inflation rate when the dust settles? Bonds have had a bit of a run, can yields fall further? 
quantitative tightening, the Fed's unwinding of their balance sheet, how will that capital complicate the situation? Will, as has been the case most times the Fed tightens, we have a break in the system, a liquidity or credit environment. The dollar has been so strong, at least until the fourth quarter, how long will that stay? And then we've got this crazy war that erupted about a year ago. And what does that mean for humanity, at least in that part of the world and oil prices in particular? And will China in its lifting of the zero COVID situation allow the uh, uh, global economy escape a recession? Some questions we'll be able to answer this year, some we won't. So let's move on to these predictions. The first of which is we do have, as I said earlier, a shallow recession as real GDP is in the bottom quintile for the last 50 years, the bottom 10 of the last 50. So why are we gonna have a recession? Well, we have an inverted yield curve, in fact, the deepest in 40 years, commodity prices are down, money growth, which a lot of people pay attention to actually turn negative. The purchasing manager indices are now all under 50 in manufacturing, and at least until recently, underperformance in financials. All those tell us maybe we'll have an, uh, a, a recession, but we believe it will be shallow. I hope that's more than wishful thinking. Reasons, cash on the balance sheets, a healthy corporate sector, an especially healthy banking system for this point in the cycle, and high yield bond spreads, which are typically a sign of trouble out there, that's not happening. Let me show you some pictures on the next slide uh, to be able to uh, communicate some of that. The yield curve, the difference between 90 day T-bills, some use two year to 10 year, you can see off to the right at the top half, it is, uh, if you will, underwater, it's negative. That's usually a lead sign. As you see in the other pieces of this particular graph, when that goes negative, the shaded area typically follows. That's a recession. Leading economic indicators, bottom left. The money supply problem that I, I talked about off, off to the right. All these say, yeah, probably going to have a recession. It'd be unusual for all these things to line up and us not have a recession. So in the next slide, we can see our forecast. As economists do, on the one hand, on the other, I'm going to have three-handed here. Our most likely case, as I said, is a mild recession, 50% probability. 30% chance we can thread the needle and have the soft landing. 20% chance it's not going to be that good. We will have a normal recession. As the year progresses, we'll refine those probabilities. Next slide shows prediction two. Inflation, as I said, has fallen a bunch already, and it will fall a bunch more, but not make it to 2%. To refresh your memories, Inflation seemed like it was near zero forever, like a whole decade. And then, of course, starting uh, fall of 2021, it began to rise, peaked at eight to nine percent. We're down to six and a fraction. We think we're heading to four or five, still a long way away from that two percent goal. Next slide shows again some pictures about the work the Fed still has to do. You see on the left hand side is core. Um, uh, 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 um, core inflation, this is the fav Fed's favorite target for inflation. And to repeat, it's down some, but boy, it's a far cry from two. And off to the right, you see the components, good versus services inflation, one coming up, the other coming down. Prediction three on the next slide. Sticking with the Fed, since they're import so important and calling the shots this cycle, the Fed fund reaches 5% and remains there for the balance of the year. As you see in the second line, sharpest since Volcker. That means rates at the Fed level have moved up faster than any time since Paul Volcker of a couple of decades ago. Some of you old people like me might remember that. We endured two recessions back to back to exercise inflation from the system. So we've had quite a move up already. Next slide shows you um, uh, some of the assumptions we have. Uh, the Fed has been raising rates 75 basis points, three quarters of 1% for a bunch of the last few meetings. We'll think they will probably move to 25 in the next meeting, which is early February. And to repeat, 5%, which is a fairly high number. And as part of the reason we think we have a mild recession, they're going to stay there longer than we expect. And to repeat, the note at the bottom, the balance sheet to unwind that massive amount of bonds that the Fed purchased 
We've not seen that before, so we don't have a playbook to go back to that. Next slide shows the fact that while in the US we've made some progress, uh, the current policy rate, the Fed funds rate, less the current CPI is still negative. It needs to go positive. But our central bank's done a lot more work. Some other central banks will still have a lot further to go. Prediction four, earnings. I think earnings will be absolutely key this year. Uh, refresh your memory, in 2021, excuse me, 2022, earnings estimates actually went up. Yeah, they came down the, uh, the back part of the year, but from January 1 to December 31, earnings estimates for the U.S. economy went up while the stock market cratered. That means that valuations were the whole story. This year, it's going to be a lot about earnings. You can see in the 2023 uh, row, the consensus is using $231, up another 8% this year. Uh, they're beginning to lower that number. I think there's a lot more to go, and we're looking at $200, down 9%. Uh, so there's more earnings revisions to happen. This is among the reasons why we have a pretty mediocre view of the stock market, as you hear in a minute. Hard for stocks to go up a lot when earnings estimates are coming down. So the next slide does show our targets relative to these three scenarios that I mentioned. Let me focus on that middle uh, row, which is our main line scenario, the mild recession. Uh, the stock market, um, uh, our guess is will close around 3,900, which is actually slightly below where it is today. We've had a good start to the year and we probably need to see a lower low. In other words, the bear market low that we saw in October uh, probably gets exceeded. There's never been a recession without the stock market making a low during the recession. It's never made that uh, move before um, the recession started. So put it back into words on the next slide, bear markets, which were undeniably, sadly, been punished through, we start with high inflation, that goes back a year or so ago, the central bank tightens, valuations for both stocks and bonds come under pressure, that's why stocks and bonds sold off, the economy slows, we have downward earnings revisions, and the question is, are we going to stop there, or are we going to see a recession, and will we have credit or liquidity risk? They're the things we'll be watching carefully, uh, obviously, to talk about markets, and more importantly, to manage uh, money. Well, where are we in a valuation uh, standpoint? This slide shows the current valuation, a bunch of different measures, uh, where we uh, are relative to history and where we were a year ago. For example, take the second row, cash flow yield. Stock market yields 6.7% on a cash flow basis. That's in the 85th percentile relative to history. In other words, still fairly expensive, but a year ago was 95. So things have gotten a little more reasonable. And you come down the page, you see all those measures. Let me put it in plain English. A year ago, stocks and bonds with 2020 hindsight were crazy expensive. Today, they're no longer crazy expensive, but they're not cheap either. They're kind of somewhere in the middle. A couple words on the bond market, flipping to the next slide. You can see the stock market, um, excuse me, the bond market since 1928, 95 years, has had 19 down years. Back-to-back -back down years, like we saw in 21 and 22, only three times. Number of three down years in a row, it's never happened. Some might say, this is a guarantee, you'll make a couple of bucks in bonds this year. I hope that's the case. And that is our best guess that stocks will have a positive return. Moving inside the stock market for a few minutes, looking at sectors. This is a rather wordy prediction, but it is that the best sectors will be energy, consumer staples, and financials. And that trio will outperform utilities, technology, and communication services. And if that happens, value, like last year, will have beaten growth. A couple of words on a couple of these sectors. Energy. Energy stocks acted like there was no bear market. The energy sector was up, up 50% last year. Financials. Um, rather cheap and of higher quality. If we don't have recession or if it's only mild, I think financials will do fine. The controversy in the underweighted sector is in technology. Some wonderful companies with great products and services. We just think there's a little more earnings risk, risk to come. And in some of the very highly valued tech stocks, probably some valuation risk. 
Next slide takes those tech stocks, the mega cap ones, compares them to the overall market. In the 11 years through 2021, you can see that revenue growth for the major tech stocks was 18% per annum for the stock market as a whole, only five. No wonder those stocks did so well. Fast forward to 21 to 24, the period we're now in, now the... And we've had a long-term pattern of, uh, in, on the next slide, uh, showing, uh, um, uh, there we go, uh, when the line's moving up, value is winning. When the line's moving down, growth is winning. I've circled in red the period of basically the last decade where growth was, it was a cat's meow that's begun to reverse. And you can see the long-term value tends to outperform. <clears throat> number tw uh, prediction number seven, active and passive outperformance trends are cyclical. So the prediction is we are in a period, if so, it'd be the second year in a row, last year was the case, not pictured here yet, because we don't have all the numbers, that the average active equity manager beats the index. Uh, people think that only index funds win. Well, for the last decade, they've been about right. But over time, it's about 50-50. Begging the question, well, are there periods when active managers tend to do better than those passive indexes? And when they, or, or they do worse, the answer is yes. And that's on slide, uh, the next slide, which shows when the average stocks beat the index, when small outperforms big, value outperforms growth. Importantly, when interest rates are flat to up, these are the characteristics when active does better. And if you tally up wh what environment we're in, we are in an environment where that may be yet again the case, which we active managers would love to see one more time. Prediction eight, Cole mentioned this up front, international stocks beat the US last year, took the fourth quarter rally international for that to happen, but for the full year, and it was one of our predictions last year that international would win. We are suggesting that probably happens again and be the second year in a row, the first time since um, uh, the, the, the middle of the OO decade. And so you can see the, the, the history and as Cole mentioned, the uh, U.S. has been, uh, been phenomenal compared to non-U.S. Uh, last year was a reversal, and we think that continues, and we give our reasons uh, on the right-hand half of this slide. The next slide uh, gives you a little more detail from a valuation standpoint. Uh, I won't translate everything on this slide, but you can see the valuation of the U.S. stock market, it, looking at the, uh, the very left-hand portion of the slide, current P.E. 17.8. That's above the median of history. Whereas developed Europe, Japan, Asia Pacific X Japan, not so the case. So those markets are cheaper than the US and their fundamentals while also questionable, what we think uh, will enable outperformance. Prediction nine, Th this is a, a global one. We always try to have one that uh, speaks to the bigger picture. And it is that India surpasses China as the world's largest, po largest population and is the fastest growing large economy. I'll spare you, spare you all the details. Suffice to say, most of the attention outside the US goes to China, appropriately so. China is a big behemoth and needs to be dealt with. And of course, they have stated they wanna become the world's uh, uh, largest economy, strongest military power, and the prowess in technology. Well, India kind of quietly is actually gonna be bigger than China and lots of measures before long. So my point in this prediction is to say, don't ignore China, but begin if you're not already to pay a lot of attention to India. Finally, prediction 10 is always a political one. And it is that a double digit number of candidates announced for president. Sadly, the day after the uh, midterm elections in November in DC, a lot of the attention already began to focus on 2024. If President Biden does not run for another term, getting this prediction right is likely to be easy. If he does announce for re-election, it's going to be tougher. Uh, the, the point is that um, too much of the attention in D.C. is already on the 2024 election. I point out in the graph on the slide, if you look off to the right, year three of the four-year term, which is this year, tends to be the strongest stock market. Uh, I say, let's hope history repeats itself. While we're on DC, let me point out a couple of things. The next uh, slide, 
shows the globalization phenomenon. If you read all the print here, you will see our review, the globalization, that each country does what it does best, has been part of the uh, strong growth that the, most of the world has seen over the last several decades. And for a lot of reasons, nationalism, um, uh, becoming more inward focused, uh, the growth of globalization has slowed uh, materially. And you see that in a lot of corporations bring their supply chains back home. Consequences of that are slower growth and weaker profitability. The other point I wanna make about Washington DC on the next slide is having argued now for many years that the debt and deficits of the United States have really not mattered. Why? Because interest rates until last year fell faster than the debt increased, which means interest expense, if you do the multiplication of those two numbers, actually fell. That's why you have not seen a lot of attention here. Sadly, having borrowed from the future for years, we are now gonna to have to pay the piper as debt as a percentage, interest expense as a percentage of global GDP are advancing significantly. So let's put a couple of things together with some conclusions. I've covered most of this. Let me uh, go through them and maybe make a comment or two. Economy, yes, is weakening, weakening probably a, a mild recession. Inflation still too high, even though it's coming down. Don't get lulled that we've reached nirvana, if you will. Fed is not done fighting the inflation battle. Earnings estimates are too high. To repeat myself, stocks and bonds are no longer expensive, but they're not cheap either. Also important to remember, if we're gonna have a recession, we have probably not seen the bottom of the stock market. If so, it'd be the first time ever. So what do I own? Stocks that can weather the, strong, the storm, strong income statements, solid balance sheets, reasonable valuations, quality is what we're looking for. Do some dollar cost averaging into international if you're not there at all. Expect some dollar weakness and the old adage is don't fight the Fed and don't fight the tape. People have lost a lot of money doing that over time. So what do you do if you agree with what we're talking about here? Expect choppy markets. As a portfolio manager, I'm more reactionary than usual. Buying the dip, dips and trimming the rallies. Focus on earnings and free cash flow, not valuation. We won't get much valuation advancement. Do, unlike our advice a year ago, where we said minimize your bond holdings, we wanna own some bonds. A 10 year treasury of three and a half is very different from one. Diversify across asset classes and geographies. Have a little more non-US. Back to the, va the, the value comment and less expensive growth. Consider an absolute return strategy to complement your market exposures. And I, and I know one ascent is doing some great work there. And to repeat, don't fight the Fed and don't fight the tape. So finally, on the last slide, I've said, okay, that's all nice theory, but Bob, what are you doing about it in the portfolios I might, uh, I, I might own? And to repeat, one of my, my privileges professionally is to manage one of sense large cap core value and growth portfolios. What am I doing as the portfolio manager in there? Being cautious, being optimist, uh, opportunistic, buying the dips and trimming the rallies on individual stocks, on sectors, on portfolios as a whole. Focusing on that quality comment I, may, I meant earlier. While cautious on technology, some of the older established tech stocks that have good cash flow, we own uh, HMOs and biotech, some of the specialty retail areas, and of course, energy, which we owned a whole lot more of it. What we're being careful of is not to own too much uh, high growth, highly competitive areas like communication services and utilities, which did better than we expected in 2022. We're underweight there. So I know that was a mouthful in a short period of time. I hope it gives you a little bit of color as to these 10 predictions, um, we, we, we make them to help ourselves and, to, and others uh, to think through the uh, always complicated and ever-changing market. So a privilege to be part of, of this call. Cole, back to you. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> it, never amaz it never ceases to amaze me how you can cover so much ground. Uh, that really was uh, running the gamut from uh, thinking about populations to politics to markets. So, Bob, thank you for your wisdom and um, just bringing that to bear for the clients that we get to serve together, uh, many of, of whom are, are on this call. Uh, enjoy your vacation. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, as we begin to move into the final portion of our call today, it's um, as Bob kind of was beginning to transition to, what do we do with all of this? 
how do we make heads or tails? How do we make sense of this information? Uh, and how do we move forward? Um, because that's uh, what we're, we're called to do. So I'm excited to bring up Nathan Willis, our Director of Portfolio Strategy. Nathan leads our uh, different allocation committees, our manager selection committee, and uh, is the, the really the leader of, of this process for us at One Ascent. And today he'll share uh, an update from our committees and outlook for 2023. Nathan? Thanks, Cole. It's great to be here. And uh, it's great to follow uh, both you and Bob. There's a tremendous amount of information and I kind of get to uh, be third in the batting order and uh, back cleanup as it were. And so what I'm going to try to do uh, today is put all of this information in the context of the One Ascent portfolios. The way I'm going to do that is first, I'm going to do a review of the markets in the fourth quarter uh, and try to put it in some broader historical context. Uh, then I'm going to show our navigator process uh, and talk about our investment outlook that flows out of, out of that process. And then finally, I'm going to talk about what actions uh, we should be taking in our portfolios. Um, <clears throat> so let's get started. Uh, Cole, you already talked about the fourth quarter, and we talked about the fact that uh, international stocks were the big winner, uh, and they were the big winner for the trailing one year as well. And you showed that in contrast to the 10-year period where U.S. stocks were significantly ahead of international stocks and small cap stocks. And it's really important to understand why this happened. Uh, one of the ways to think about it is to put that 10-year period in the broader context. So we've looked at a 25-year period as well. And what you can see here is that when you look at the 25-year period, the very, very long-term uh, U.S. small cap international emerging market stocks are all much closer in returns. And this period where the U.S. large cap market has been so strong uh, at the expense of everything else is not normal. Um, so how do we process that? Um, what has driven stock returns for the last 10 years? In order to answer that question, I'm going to tell uh, kind of a funny little story. Uh, two young fish meet an older fish who swims by, nods at them, and says, morning, boys, how's the water? Uh, the two young fish keep swimming, and then after a minute or so, one of them turns to the other and says, what the heck is water? Uh, the point of the illustration is to say the thing that was most important to the fish uh, the thing that defines their reality, uh, the thing that most affects their life uh, is the thing that they really don't pay attention to and they're not they're not aware of it. Right. And so uh, likewise, we tend to lose our awareness of some things uh, when they become so important uh, and last for so long. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Here's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, Bob talked about the fact that the Fed had a lot of selling of assets to do. So we're going to go back in history a little bit and talk about how that came about. Um, this green line you see is the Federal Reserve balance sheet. So this is all the assets they own. Usually, and for the most uh, most of their history, there was really no money creation. Uh, what they did was just to kind of facilitate transactions between banks. And so, you know, they had a few hundred billion dollars of assets, uh, but it was just to kind of help facilitate, you know, keep the wheels greased. Uh, all of a sudden during the global financial crisis, the Fed had to step in and buy assets. And they did that by creating money. Uh, they bought, they created money out of nowhere, out of fiat, uh, and then they bought assets. And so by doing this, they created money. Uh, in fact, this was an unprecedented money creation experiment that lasted far longer than it should have. And then during the pandemic, it really accelerated uh, and lasted through the end of 2021. So we've had this unprecedented creation of seven and a half trillion dollars. And I was trying to figure out how to put that in context. And so I went back and I looked at the global uh, you know, the government accounts that track corporate profits. And for 2021, U.S. companies aggregate corporate profits were two and a half trillion. OK, so what that means is during the 13 years of 2009 to 2021, the government created out of thin air three years worth of corporate profits and just gave them to us. OK, um, that obviously had a huge impact. The other thing they did, which you can see on this chart, is they kept interest rates low, lower than they've ever been, a quarter percent for nine of those 13 years. So what effect did this have? Well, first, before we look at the effect, I've shaded this area in blue, uh, and the chart uh, title uh, says this is water. Uh, the whole point of the uh, fish analogy was to say that this easy money, this money creation produced by the Fed is the water, so to speak, that has really driven stock markets and corporate profits 
uh, for really 13 years through the end of 2021. So how do we process this? The way we do that is we look at the stock market. So this uh, gold line here uh, I've superimposed is the S&P 500. As you can see, it's gone up a lot, but I don't know that you would necessarily put the number to it. So I went and did the research. From the end of 2008 through the end of 2020-21, the S&P was up 16% annualized. Now, if you put that in the context of very long-term returns, and I'm talking 50, 80, 100 years, in general, most people would kind of measure between 8 and 10% returns for the stock market. So from 2009 through 2021, we had almost double the return in U.S. large cap stocks than we would normally expect. So this is really important, uh, but what does it tell us about the future? Um, well, <clears throat> I'm going to use the Chicago Cubs to talk about the future. But before I do that, I'm going to go through our Navigator Outlook. The Navigator uh, is our process of evaluating the data and categorizing it and determining where we are uh, in the investment and macroeconomic cycle. So first of all, let's talk about valuations. And Bob has talked about this. Uh, what I've done here is I've printed a 25-year chart. And the blue line here is the Bloomberg aggregate bond yield. So this is essentially the broad bond market. And this is the yield you're getting. Um, if you look, starting after the end of the global financial crisis, you have, you earned very little. You earn 3% or less every year. Uh, but as you can see, those yields have become more attractive. And right now, you're earning over 4.5% uh, just buying the whole bond market. At the same time, the S&P 500 has gotten much more uh, inexpensive on a 25-year basis. And so it's gotten more attractive and it's really come back down to between 17 and 18, uh, depending on the day in which forward earnings estimate you're looking at. But that 17.4 number is essentially the 25-year average. So bonds have gotten back to average. But as Bob put uh, in all of his data, which is, which is really good context to understand, maybe cheap or average rather over the last 25 years, but pretty expensive in the longer term context. Uh, and the other thing I'll point out here is that if you look at the coming out of the tech bubble, PEs were really high. Well, they didn't stop when they got to average, where we are today. Uh, that average point is right about where bonds and stocks diverged there in 2003. Well, they didn't stop at 17. They kept going, all right, uh, even before the global financial crisis. So one of the problems here is that it's gotten back to average for the 25 years, um, but it may go further. Uh, we don't really know, but there's risk. So we're calling valuation a neutral. Uh, it's a lot better than it was. Uh, but it's not anything that we uh, jump up and down about. The next thing we're going to do is talk about uh, the economy. And when we look at the economy, there are really three things that we look at, right? Uh, first, we look at inflation. Then we look at recession. And we look at corporate earnings and how that might be affected by the potential of a recession. So the chart on the left is the same chart that Bob used um, in one of his uh, charts, and it is uh, what we think of as the Fed's preferred recession indicator, and it's flashing a warning sign. So we think there's probably going to be a recession, but on the right, what we need to do is understand the market expectations. And this is a little bit of a complicated chart, so I'm going to walk you through it. Each dot is a Fed open market member estimate of where the Federal Reserve interest rate is going to be at that point in time. This chart was produced during their December of 2022 meeting, and so they were all on, on the same page, right? They all had the same expectation, but you can see there's a lot of divergence uh, for 2023, and they expect rates to be over 5%, and in 2024, they expect rates to come down. Uh, that average is the gray line. The problem is the blue line is what the market thinks. The market thinks rates are going to be about three quarters percent lower in 2023 than the Fed thinks. Fed speakers have come out and consistently said they won't start lowering rates in 2023, but the, but the market thinks that they're going to start lowering rates in 2023. And the difficulty here is that this is likely to create some volatility, right? We've had a lot of volatility. Every time there's been a soft piece of data, the market has said, oh, this is going to be great. Bad news is good news, and the market goes up. And then a couple of days later, uh, a member of the Fed speaks, and they say, well, we're really committed to the inflation fight. 
Um, and so there's probably going to be volatility like we've had uh, in the market. Uh, so our view of the economy is a little bit negative. Uh, and that also relates to corporate profits, as Bob as Bob went through. We're not going to go into more detail there. But lastly, we look at technicals and sentiment in the market. So the technicals um, are illustrated by this chart. This is a chart that Bob used a year ago. Um, and this is the S&P 500 on the top and the cumulative advanced decline line on the bottom. And that cumulative advanced decline line illustrates how many stocks are going up versus how many stocks are going down. And Bob, a year ago, pointed out that while the S&P was going up through 2021, the S&P 500 advanced decline line was really kind of stalling out and was steady. Uh, and you see as the market declined, the advanced decline line declined. But one of the things that's uh, optimistic for the market now is that when the market bottomed at the beginning of the fourth quarter, the advanced decline line, the market breadth uh, stabilized as well and has gone up since then. So that gives us a little bit of a hope. Um, one of the things um, that we are uh, also looking at are the short-term technicals. And we had such a strong rally um, so far this year uh, that there's a little bit of an oversold condition uh, in the short term. So while the longer and medium term technicals are, are relatively positive, uh, we're calling the technical picture overall uh, neutral. Uh, lastly, we'll talk about sentiment. And investor sentiment is one chart that we show a lot. Uh, and it's a very good contrarian indicator. Uh, you can see the red is the line of in percentage of investors who are bearish, and it's been very, very high. Uh, and the green is the line of invest investors who are bullish, and that's been very, very low, really for over a year now. Uh, and this generally gives us a lot of confidence about the future, because when everybody's bearish, there's nobody left to sell. Uh, so we see sentiment as a positive, and overall, um, this gives us a neutral outlook, right? We have a couple of neutrals, one uh, kind of underweight and one overweight. And so we think it's appropriate to be right at your asset allocation target. Uh, in, in our navigator sleeve, we are neutral. So our asset allocation is right at our long-term strategic. Um, so we're happy to be invested, but we're not overweight. Um, so what does that tell us about the future? Uh, and what do the Cubs tell us about the future? Chicago Cubs are a perennial average, and that's where I'm going with this. We're talking, going to talk about averages and going back to averages. The Cubs' 100-year winning percentage is 49.1%. You don't go to Wrigley Field necessarily expecting a win. You go expecting an experience, and you enjoy yourself. Nevertheless, in 2016, they won 64% of their games and were World Series champions. But if you look at the chart, you can see they reverted to the mean. They are back now comfortably below 500 uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, and they're, they're the cubbies we all know uh, and, they're, and they're mediocrity. So how does that relate to investments? Uh, reversion to the mean is something that is a really important force. And it applies to the Cubs winning percentage, but it also applies to the investment markets. And there are two ways that it's going to apply. Uh, we talked about uh, profit margins uh, declining, and that is a mean reverting data series. So profit margins have declined the last five quarters, and we expect that to continue, and that's going to kind of temper our outlook on stocks. But also, uh, market valuations are something that we see as mean reverting. And so we talked about the fact that the S&P 500 had a tremendous 16% return through the end of 2021 since the middle of the financial crisis. And obviously that, that return has been bad, but let's look at the valuation of the S&P 500 relative to some other opportunities and see if there's any ways we actually can make money. So the first place we're gonna look is international stocks. And this goes you know, hand in hand with what Bob said. Uh, this chart shows the valuation of the S&P 500 and the valuation of the Morgan Stanley EFI international stocks. And for this, I've used the price to sales ratio rather than the PE ratio. It, sh it shows the same story, but the PE ratio was really volatile during the global financial crisis. So it's just simpler to show it this way. More importantly, though, is on the bottom, we show the S&P 500 price to sales ratio minus the Morgan Stanley EFI price to sales ratio. So this is, in a sense, the premium you're paying to own U.S. stocks. And you can see that premium was very high during the tech bubble, 
Uh, and then it declined down until the global financial crisis when both were priced relatively cheaply. Uh, but then as the Fed dumped all this money into the system from 2009 through 2021, you had a huge premium develop in terms of the valuation of U.S. stocks versus international stocks. We think that premium has begun to unwind, uh, but there's probably a decent amount further to go. One of Sam portfolios have a large allocation to international stocks. Um, and just recently, uh, on a short-term basis, we added money to our emerging markets uh, portfolio in our, in our tactical navigator sleeve uh, based upon the uh, increased earnings estimates um, from China reopening. So we think international is a really good opportunity relative to the U.S. Another opportunity as well as small cap stocks. This is the same chart, but the green is the S&P 500 and the gray is the Russell 2000 measure of small cap stocks. And again, when you look at the bottom, you see small cap stocks uh, were at a huge discount or the S&P 500 was at a huge premium during the tech bubble. And that unwound and small cap stocks did really, really well after the tech bubble. But then that premium has come again as the Fed has loaded money into the system. So again, we think this premium is beginning to unwind, but there's probably more to go. One Ascent has a healthy allocation to small cap stocks as well. So these are a couple of things that I wanted to share just to put the big picture in context. I feel like it's important to understand the trajectory of valuation, not just the, the current data point. So hopefully this helps put some context around how we're allocating. So now it's time to get to the point of where we are actually illustrating what we're doing in portfolios. So what is our game plan? Uh, what would we recommend for you? And what are we doing in one ascent portfolios? So the first thing that we want to talk about is the fact that stock volatility may continue, right? And so our recommendation is to consider using alternative strategies, those lower portfolio volatility, and they capture diversified return drivers. Uh, as Bob mentioned, we use Bob's market neutral strategy uh, in our alternative sleeve, and that's uh, really benefited that strategy. And we're very happy with uh, that as a complement to the broader portfolios. Additionally, we had a huge return in the S&P 500, 16% for that 2009 to 2021 period. Uh, and going forward, returns may be lower, a little bit lower than average. Our 10-year forecast for the S&P 500 is about 7% relative to the historical average of 8, 9, or 10%. So one of the things that we think you need to do is to make use of tactical strategies, also focus on how you rebalance, and also take advantage of tax loss selling opportunities uh, where it may be appropriate for your portfolio. Well, I talked with a couple charts about stocks experiencing mean reversion. And so we would advise you to increase your international and small and mid cap stock holdings. And we are doing that. We hold a lot of those in one ascent portfolios. Finally, uh, bond yields are attractive again. Everyone's jumping up and down. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, but the key point here is that you don't need to take excessive risk in the bond market to earn attractive returns. Um, you can actually take a high quality portfolio uh, and not 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 jump uh, jump too far out on the risk curve. So one ascent portfolios are a little bit higher quality than the benchmark and a little bit shorter in average maturity. Uh, and we feel really comfortable with that with that allocation. Um, so I hope I was able to frame uh, Bob's wisdom in the context of our portfolios and what we're doing. Uh, we appreciate your uh, partnership with us. And Cole, I'm going to hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, Nathan. <clears throat> As we wrap up and conclude, just want to thank you again for your time. Uh, we know that you could uh, be spending your time in lots of ways and you chose to, to be with us this morning. We thank you for that. Um, we covered a lot of ground, a lot of information. Uh, as we always do, a recording of this call will be made available on our website. Uh, and for many of you who registered, you'll get an email of that in your inbox. Um, we'd love to, to share more. Uh, we've got more to share about values-based investing, uh, about our outlook and thoughts in the market, about ways that we could potentially serve or partner together. I encourage you to visit our website, investments.oneascent.com or email us at info at oneascent.com. Lots of information to share. Uh, but again, thank you for being with us. Uh, that'll conclude our call for today. And we look forward to speaking with you in April uh, for Q2. Thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your day. God bless.